Hello and welcome to the SaaS Growth Podcast. This week we're here with Rod Moynihan, the CEO of BAC, an Australian-based technology consultancy. How are you today, Rod? Very well, thank you, Carl. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for being here. I know it's very early for you. Um, I'm in Finland, <laughs> you're in Australia. It's an awful time gap to navigate. So again, thanks a lot for being here. Um, can you explain to me BAC and the, why it exists and what sort of challenges it solves? Yeah, thanks, Ken. I guess as I, I think about the third decade of my, my career, the learnings that have been consumed through that period of time has been done through helping mid-market and enterprise grade organizations migrate through technology and process, process re-engineering transformation programs. And during that period of time, I've had the pleasure of being on both sides of the consulting fence or the vendor fence either leading SaaS companies in the B2B space here in, in region or leading solving businesses who were, were assisting organizations through that evaluation and eventually into the delivery and realization of those those projects that they undertake. Uh, BAC was built predominantly because we saw a gap in the market, particularly around how organizations could assess singular or multiple SaaS platforms to aggregate that into a redesign of their processes and then implement that seeing low code, no code type of SAF products. And so we formed the company about four and a half years ago with a view that, that we would we would attack this with a predominant focus in around the go-to-market strategies of companies. In simplest terms, it means as go-to-market is obviously marketing sales and services support components of how companies serve their customers and provide and provision, provision their products. So four and a half years on, we, we have some good relationships in place with technology platforms. We also architect very strong due diligence um, work in, in the pre-sales components and have some strong tools there to help companies avoid risk and, and mitigate problems of failure, which are, can be quite common in, in large-scale transformation programs. And obviously, have embedded risk of project methodologies to ensure that customers get a high-value outcome within a budget and within the agreed time frame. That's why we exist, because we see a gap in, in that market there to do that strongly and, and manage risk through that process to get high-value high outcomes. What sort of considerations do company normal, that companies normally have when you come in with these like single or multi sas solutions and redo their processes? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the big question in many ways because it will differ depending on the market and the industries we play in and the domains that we're focusing on. It also depends on the maturity of the organization, whether or not they've been through a cycle of all evaluations and like this before. I'd say that we typically, when we come into an organization, come on the back of one of our vendors already being engaged. And, and often that is, can be a point of sensitivity because despite all vendors' best intentions, and I've sat on, on, on both sides, so led a number of vendors in market, I think there is, there is a sense of skepticism sometimes from the buyer that the vendor certainly will just say yes to everything and everything can be done. And at the end of the day, when we come in, we obviously carry a higher level of risk than the vendor does. And I often talk about this with customers in the early part of their evaluation process is that when all is said and done and you sign a, a subscription agreement with a, with a software provider, the buck stops with us and it stops with you being the client to ensure that the realization of what you want to achieve is done. And so we often really push clients to do more increased DD or due diligence in that evaluation cycle certainly to maintain the risk on our side and also to maximize the outcome for the client. So I think, again, depending on the maturity, we work in a number of key verticals and within those verticals, we see very distinct levels of maturity differences in, in how they will approach an evaluation. But our core to what we do is to go as deep as we can into the as is state, particularly around the process and the data models, also the technology landscape as it exists today, because obviously decommissioning or integrating with existing platforms to get a more robust outcome needs significant the, the, the amount of due diligence up front. And sometimes clients just don't have the, the wherewithal to actually understand how to do that. So we'd lead them through it. We have a number of core assets that we bring to the table that help them. But for the most part, most people aren't necessarily that ready to go to the level of depth that we will ask them to. And again, this is non-chargeable exercise on our side to ensure that the risk is managed. Of course. I know for enterprise, like any time I've worked in bigger companies, it's all about risk. It's all about risk mitigation. So it's really good that you help with that because it's, it's not always done well. Um, yeah, risk is an interesting one, Carl, because we think about risk in three layers. 
there's obviously the process risks. What are your mandatory processes that you need to retain in place to, to just simply run your company to ensure that you have the efficacy of how you operate today still remains once you move to a new series of platforms or a transformed technology stack. Number one, that's that process design side. The next one for is the data models. So ensuring that we, we maintain the accuracy or improve the manner in which data is used to serve either the employee or to serve the customer in, in, in the go to market journey. And then I think thirdly is the change management. This is what a propensity for the organization to be able to actually handle and take on the change and what level of change should we think about doing either in a step change process or a big bang process. Flipping back a little bit onto the mm. sorts of technology changes you drive, what do you typically look for in a customer that like, what needs to be true about a customer for them to need BAC and to have them step in? Like when would you want, where would you want a customer to be for them to be a perfect client for you? Again, we, I think there's the obvious ones there that there is a burning platform for change. So it's something's going on either within your organization or within the industry they play in. And so they, they hopefully had done some evaluation around what a redesigned process data and journey model would look like inside their organization. Number one. So there needs to be some pre-evaluation the client is done or some burning platform, number one. Number two, it's the most obvious one is that they, they have realistic understanding of what effort an investment is going to be needed to do that. And that's backed up by real a balance of the impact of doing the project on their internal people who are going to be involved. Number one, number two, realistic view of how long it's going to take. And number three, what budget's going to be applied to this. I think the other aspect of this is that a lot of the time we engaged in parts of the organization that perhaps haven't guided and seen a part of the business through what they're trying to do. So we certainly need organizational leadership at the, sorry, organizational buy in at, at a leadership level. We have to talk about, this potentially, we often talk about doing, doing a transformation, you could go to market strategy, it's like, like having a heart and lung transplant. It's a thing that produces your revenue. It's a thing that produces money that, that comes into your organization, it's a thing that manages your balance sheet and you can't get that wrong. And so ultimately at the end of the day, we talk about the fact we're, we're holding the scalp and we're, we're about to kind of go in there and rip it, replace the core things that drive the blood, the oxygen and, and keep you alive and that's either give you greater performance, we do it really well. And so there's no one's going to go in and do that without fully understanding the ramifications of getting that first cut of the scalp. We can put it that way. So it doesn't need that leadership, it doesn't need organizational awareness and leadership and buy-in. Given the risk, the potential risk of those sorts of transformations, how do you go about getting buy-in from stakeholders and leadership team? Yes, again, probably the opening question you asked about why we exist is one of the things that I learned from being on both sides of the fence. When I say both sides of the fence, I don't mean the customer side, but having been on the vendor side and led a number of pretty large software vendors here in region, and then being on the consulting side, like actually doing the direct review, running the implementation. One of the things that there is often a big fail point is the vendor or the pre-sale requirements gathering and assessment gathering to then moving into doing a project. It, there's usually a big gap between how much requirements are gathered, how much understanding there is of a body and state. Where do you start the project? So you know, in a long winded way, the way we do it is we have produced a number of, of pre-sales assets that by osmosis dragged the executive team into the process. And so when we go through what we call, we do it, we, like everyone else, we do requirements gathering, but the way we architect that is a little bit different. And as I said earlier, often we request a lot more of clients into DD to do a part of the requirements gathering and then they're probably you know, they're already ready to do. But we have produced good tools and good systems that ensure that when we are looking at the as is to be process design and the data models and the, and the user journeys in there, that if we will identify points of contact that need to be part of our evaluation process. And look, put simply, if they don't, we can't get access to that. We usually walk away from the project because it just exposes too much risk for everyone. Typically, we, we as we go through our solution design workshops and wireframe frameworks, we identify key processes and we identify the people in those processes who need to give us data points and give us information. And so as we go through that, we assemble the right people and we assemble a very strong and, and disciplined outcome for them. It's rare once we get going that 
to take buy-in because it is quite a, the frameworks we use, uh, uh, I guess they see the value of Kisabay. And again, to your point, if we've done our due diligence on the, the type of call out that we're working with and their propensity and readiness for change, the typical of the boss is normally we don't have that much of a challenge, but again, we've designed a framework that does work and does invite people into Kisabay. It sounds like you guys work a lot with so more non-technical people, right? So that seems to be a lot of where you end up in, in an organization. So how does, you did mention low code and no code tools mm -hmm. as part of your offering. So how does that sort of fit into the organizational change and innovations that you drive? Mm -hmm. so, so it's an interesting part of your open question there around the, the kind of non-technical people. It is interesting to, to think today that if I went back even 10, 15 years ago, every major transformation that took place inside an organization was led by the tech part of the business, which uh, rightfully in many ways, part of an evaluation has to be a tech component of it. So there has to be the assessment of the alignment of new tools coming in. That alignment comes in, in in many different ways. And I won't go into all that. It could be around security. It could be around uh, future purpose in terms of integration component, which is existing stack. But the tech team extensively don't own the business process. And the business process is the most important one that's usually owned by the business. We respect the role of technology in, in evaluating kids, but we really target it on the business own. Uh, I think that technology, so in my mind, is an end state. It's not a start state. If, if your start state is understanding your processes. And there's something I've said from the engineering side as well. Engineers don't, we don't um, invent, codify it. So we'll bake it in, right. but we're not the ones who actually make it up. And again, it's respectful to the tech parts of business because they play a, an overarching and very important role in, in ensuring that whatever new stack is brought in or introduced to the organization fits within the, the broader tech strategy. But it, it shouldn't be the number one reason for making a pro or a negative decision on a, on a set of mutual communities. Your, your process design, number one, and we often, it's actually interesting, Carl, when we take people through our pre-sales and say our pre-sales framework, to our, our, our process design frameworks, often what we come up with is the first time they've ever designed. Like we, just recently, we are working with a massive energy company here in Australia, and we're working across the entire marketing sales, both in-house and field sales and customer service support teams. And we ran about seven workshops with them over a few weeks. And by the time we finished, we presented them with a process design mock, which they had never seen across the entire customer journey and data journey. And, and it was like, they sat there and said, we, you know, we, we, we've never been able to define this. And so that became for us, the architecture then to do the due diligence around what software tools do you have today that you should sweat, continue to use, and we're not adopting as well as you should be. And we're in the gaps in terms of where we should be introducing new tools. But yeah, it's, oh, but most companies don't have it as an end-to-end -end process, which I find, again, why we exist, why we built our business the way we work, is because it, it's a, a light going off moment once, once we actually present it back, so this is what it really looks like. It's definitely something I've experienced as well. People get really insular and then all these processes start almost get reinvented between different departments and then those sort of cross boundaries never get established. And it's surprising, even it's, at massive scale, just how much is improvised in terms of process and just well, added correct. to willy nilly. It becomes a very difficult time packet, number one, and then to change it becomes even harder because it's ingrained. It's, well, that's the way it's always been. That's why it works. And particularly to, to our earlier point, it's the processes are technology led, not business led. You end up uh, with a very different, a different way of working. I know that it's, uh, this is back in my like bachelor of commerce days, but I remember talking yeah. about that being a huge risk of any technology process is getting buy-in from the people who actually have to like do the work. You, you're touching on that. We talked about the risk before and the third town of risk that we work on is the change management side. And I think often we companies get a little bit confused between the difference between what I call people change management or process change management and technology change management. Tech change management is the easy one for me because that's really about ensuring that the tools are can work in a symbiotic way from a technology standpoint. The, the failure point for almost every organization, so like, I'll give you multiple examples where we might get engaged to go and do a, I don't know, two $300,000 implementation of a sales and marketing that will do all the stuff we talked about earlier to do this. 
And you'll say, okay, the greatest risk here now is that we, we understand what the process redesign looks like. We know what the target end state looks like. We're very clear on the fact that the platforms can be designed and architected to deliver that. The risk we now see is adoption. So once we actually get this through the process, who's going to use it and how well they're going to use it because without usability, sorry, without users using it, target end state will fail anyway, no matter how well we build it and design it. And often when we sit with people and say, so we need to do a proper change, people orientation, change management program. I'm not just talking about doing training, right? That's the easy one. And you might say, and, and people, to me, it's one of the greatest insurance policies that a company can put in is to put in a proper comms program and a proper change management program throughout the, which all you start implementing during the implementation and post implementation should be an always on activity change management. And when you talk to a lot of organizations about it, maybe investing in that 10% of their total invest project on change management, but 90% of the companies don't want to do it. And my way of thinking, you're about to go and spend a million dollars on software, a couple hundred thousand dollars on implementation. This is, if I used a race car analogy, this is like putting the right tires on the, on, on the most high performance vehicle you just bought. Well, that's so fishy. You put the wrong tires on, on, on a Formula One car, it doesn't matter how well it's designed, it's not going to perform. And that's like your insurance I think policy. Of it like you've got the supercar, but then you just pick a random job off the street to drive it. You no, don't tell them what to do. Just gets in. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And so I think once all the hard work, so a lot of companies think the hard work is doing the evaluation and making the, 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 the right decision. Yeah, that is a lot of work involved in that. But the actual hard work is once you start the project, because that's where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Quite literally in your analogy. <laughs> correct. Correct. So yes, yeah, it's, it's the change management aspect is certainly something I think having the, depending on the size of the transformation and the impact you're trying to get from that transformation of that project, I would definitely encourage anyone to think about the change management aspect of it, which will influence the adoption, which ultimately protects your investment. And it's what software companies worry about the most, which funnily enough, they don't encourage a lot of companies to take on change management. Just if you're a SaaS company out there today, the number, the, the two things that your stakeholders or your shareholders will look at is the sign of the MRR, monthly recurring revenue, or the ARR. And the next thing they'll look at is term. So how long is the term? And they worry about low MRR and low term because they want stickiness. And stickiness is driven purely by adoption. So if you can't get adoption, you don't get stickiness. And then at the end of the day, the client doesn't see that value in their investment. So it wouldn't be 2024 unless I asked you about AI and machine learning and how that is fitting into the work you do and this and organizational change. So what sort of role has it been playing? And it was only yesterday I was reading a stat. Actually, I was watching regularly watched a video on the latest uh, open AI release, which is quite mind blowing around its verbal orientation and verbal instructions. But it, it is interesting because I, we, because we play in the go to market space, so the marketing, sales and customer service support. I look at those in terms of the three very unique domains that aggregate across a whole customer journey. So one's designed to get your brand out there and attract people to, to want to buy your services, your products, that's your marketing. Eh? The next is your sales arm. So once someone's been converted, don't create some form of inquiry of interest. You then take them through a sales cycle that hopefully ends in commitment. And post-commitment, you then have someone who's using a tool or service that you have that is going to require some nurturing or support to either grow them or retain them. Each of those domains, the way I see it, have been on very different maturing journeys with AI. So if we started with the customer services support side, we've seen probably at least, I, I ran a, a software company here in Australia for just over three and a half years called Zendesk, which is very much driven around customer service support. We saw huge leaps and bounds around 2015, 2016 with machine learning in around that. So whether or not it was the use of chatbots that were sitting on top of knowledge bases and a whole heap of data that was serving up specific responses to you that were based on trending analysis that machine learning was doing, whether or not it was reorientating you around different answers, but self-service became a, a very big thing around 2015, 2016 and onwards and still is today in the customer service support. And that was a was driven by organizations trying to drive their cost to serve down, but obviously adopting machine learning in that area. If we then look at that sheer today with AI, it's a supercharge even more. So taking the machine learning components and then putting the artificial intelligence on top of it and shaking it to a new level. If you reverse engineer, so go, go from the end state where customers already consumed and bought and just looking at service support 
aspects through through self-service. We look at the sales orientation piece down. It's a very unique domain uh, where we're seeing AI actually create from a sales standpoint, uh, tell us for salespeople and for people in the sales arm now that are orientating them through prospecting activities without having happy to really do much planning. So an example with one of the software vendors we work with now is they have an AI prospecting dashboard. So each for every interaction that a, that a prospect is doing, whether or not it's direct, indirect, it's creating the next best step and obviously and orientating things like building emails, building your comms plans, building up profiles on your on, on the personas that you're working with and effectively creating a, a, a very personalized targeted touch plan through the end consumer without the salesperson actually having to sit down and build those sales strategies. It's it was shot orientating those sales strategies with a specific persona or personas in mind, which I think is quite remarkable. We may see the we may see the end of sales people in the coming years, and then on the marketing side, we're all very clear what it's doing there in terms of how AI is actually creating content, and how AI is self orientated content that's specific for marketers, and also accelerating the path of actually creating marketing materials that are very specific. Whether or not it's an example inside some of the tools we see, I know other tools like Adobe are doing it. You can just ask them, you can ask them to create a layout now and it will go and create it very specifically, do the artwork, do the messaging, create the landing page and build that in, in seconds versus you know, how it used to traditionally be done. And more importantly, not just looking at content uh, within a single database, but looking at across multiple platforms to actually serve up this particular information, which it's taken away a lot of the swivel chairing that marketers would have to do to go and find content and build it previously. So AI in the area we played. Now, if with me saying all of that, the reality is what, what we're not seeing com companies, I, I get the sense that a lot of companies are a little confused about where to start. We're probably lucky that we play in those three domains and we can very much target into the unique AI use cases that are there. But I think there's such an overall all AI discussion right now where do organizations start? And I get asked that just privately and personally in my everyday conversation, where do we start, right? Where do we go with this? I, I think we're all using it in some aspect, whether or not we know we're using it or not. How important do you think, because you mentioned personalization before um, in regards to AI. So how important do you think it is for companies to be investing in the sort of personalization and especially the personalization that AI can bring? I think if you're not doing it, you're going you're gonna to find yourself redundant. I think uh, organizations are rapidly evolving a new way that your prospects or your customers interacting with you whether, and, and whether or not they know that it's, it's AI driven or not, the level of personalization is getting very, is getting quite significant. I think though, however, uh, I don't know how, how often you get spam with emails that, uh, that feel like they're trying to be personal then you can tell that they're, they're orientated through some sort of AI platform, but uh, to quite and feel quite generic at times, but I do I do think if you're if you're not reaching our personalization, and it's always been the case whether or not it's AI driven or not, you, you've always got to link bar of personalization. And in particular, I think the area of personalization that I think is an area that AI plays a core role in power of evaluation now uh, sits clearly in the hand in the digital hands of your end user. The amount of things they can find out about your products and services online or through their own uh, search assessments. That's where personalization becomes quite important, I think, for me and how to play what I call like a, almost a quiet digital role in the background through AI with your customers while they're, or the prospects while they're it, it, engaging with your brand or your products and services. That's where AI, starts, which for me, become quite powerful because it's working for you in behind the scenes. What other strategies do you see typically employed to help with personalization? Especially because you mentioned you see those generic ones and that sort of really lack authenticity, which I think is mm -hmm. a big pitfall, right? If it's good, you don't know it, you don't notice, but if it's mm -hmm. bad, then it sticks out. So like, how did you, how do you manage that when you're dealing with the personalization? Yeah. And again, I, I, I don't think there's a, oh, an answer I can give you that will fit everybody who might be listening to the podcast, but it will vary depending on products and services and in the industry as you play in. I still think there's a, I still think there's a role for human to human in, in, in personal interaction. I don't think we can ever remove that. I think the last human mile in, in, in a lot of, in a lot of interactions is very important. If you're in for your financial services today, let's say you're offering up either secured or unsecured lending products, pretty much go through an entire process of evaluating the, the lending product, signing up to it, putting up 
whatever the KYC requirements are, know your customer requirements for authorization to get that lending product all the way through to completing the origination program and, and getting your getting the money in your bank without talking to anyone. So the you know, so, so the industries there, you can do that. Look at healthcare, just look at something like an aged care environment, which still is very important because usually the consumer that's looking at either the various aged care options that are available, usually it's not the end user. It's usually a father, a mother, a, a brother, a sister who's evaluating where, where they're going to put their mum or the dads. That's got a huge human interaction component to it, but of course the evaluation is going to be done without any human interaction. And so depending on the industry you're in, I still think some of the recommendations that I, I say to people around AI is just be careful around where the last human mile exists or where the human mile needs to be embedded. Because if you try to AI everything, I think you can also lose some of your uniqueness in, in, in the decision-making orientation and personalization. I think there's also, because things like ChatGPT is this, it's so impressive now. It's very good that it's difficult to see where it's weak. And so mm-hmm. you're investing in this technology that it's still a lot of, it's a bit of a black box and AI and machine learning always will be. I know it's been a problem in the computer science sphere of these hidden biases getting built in and these hidden decision making that you can't really influence and it's really difficult to codify. So I can definitely see mm-hmm. that you don't want to like going 90% into AI is good, but that last little bit needs to exist. Just that sort of sanity check, human to human. But, but not, yeah, and I agree on the chat GPT side. I, we use it a lot internally and not only just for how we try to sort client issues or client problems, particularly around process design, but we also use it for ourselves in terms of we, we, we recently did some rebranding exercises and we fed all our branding information, all our themes, all our messaging into chat GPT to help reorientate some of the branding messaging that we want to do for our company and in the space of we fed huge amounts of, we gave our entire branding kit to chat GPT and went through an evaluation process to ensure we stay true to the messaging, the branding of VAC to re-architect some new messaging. Sure. So yeah, it, it was a really interesting exercise to go through, but at the end of the day, it still needs to be delivered by someone somewhere in terms of uh, how we take that to, to market. We cut, for example, we did this particularly specifically for a conference we were at and we had some, we had a main stage aspect that we wanted to deliver. And that's an example where someone still had to, a human still had to be on stage delivering that messaging. That would be very yeah. weird the day we get an AI-driven voice on a stage, just reading AI-driven messaging to an audience. But I don't know about you, Carl, but like even just looking at things like LinkedIn at the moment, I, I can see when something's been AI written now. It seems it's so obvious. Yeah, there's definitely a chat GPT has a tone that's very obvious, yeah. And it gets weird yeah. now because obviously chat, it all learns from the content on things like LinkedIn and, and the internet, but more and more of yeah. that is AI written. So it's going to start trying to learn off itself, which is going to be strange. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, thank you for being here. Is there anything you'd want me to ask before we wrap up? Is there anything you want to dive into more deeply? Not necessarily. I think my kind of summary from today's conversation is continue to emphasize the point that technology is not a start state. I think the start state is understanding your business and the processes you're trying to deliver and, and understanding the end state and the impact you're trying to get with the project and the investment that you're going to put in. And then I, I would emphasize again before we should like close out the, the points of any major transformation program that uh, you have your, your key buy-in. Uh, but you also have uh, a strong understanding of what the change management exercise that you'll need to go through during the evaluation, during the project and post, post project go live. I, I think thousands of projects in 20 plus years of seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly of these programs. They, for me, they sound like very simple things to take away, but they are fundamental to the foundations of success. Again, thanks for coming, Rod. So this is Rod Minahan. So where can people reach you, Rod? You can, reach me, uh, you can reach us through the bsd.co, which is our website, and uh, if anyone was interested to, to do that, or email me on moynihan at bscpartners.com.au, or ping me on LinkedIn through my Moynihan handle in LinkedIn. Awesome. And thanks for coming. Everyone else, we'll see you next week.